Welcome to CapStrat this week. This week we'll be leading the video off with some more central bank talk. Big week as, as many of the weeks are lately for central banks. Uh, we had the first Bank of Japan rate hike in 17 years. There are people driving around America that are experiencing their first BOJ rate hike <laughs> of their lives. So that's, that's a big deal. Um, but maybe more importantly for our US-based viewers, the FOMC. Had, a, had another meeting uh, last week. Interesting developments from there. We got the summary of economic projections. The Fed increasing their projections for 2024 economic growth and inflation, mm -hmm. but also saying that three rate cuts right. are still on the table. Yeah. So in our opinion, kind of exhibiting their bias towards cutting and, and wanting to go down that path. So um, some interesting stuff we, we want to hit on. But an interesting question that gets thrown around is, uh, is this time different, right? And so, you know, we're, we're noticing a trend and we wanted to dive in with our viewers on, you know, how could this monetary policy cycle be developing differently than what we're accustomed to seeing yeah. historically? And what we want to look at here, we're, we'll focus on recent history for now, but what we're looking at in the red and green is the financial conditions impulse on growth. This is a Fed model. So this is coming directly from the Fed. Basically, expectations on how current financial conditions will impact economic growth going forward. And then blue is our, our typical real GDP growth that we see. And what we want to look at here is just this divergence of, you can see financial conditions tightening, essentially, right? Expected to have a notable negative impact on economic growth. But economic growth has completely turned the other way. And we're looking at around 3%-ish for 2024. So Mike, what is happening here? What, what is driving this divergence? Should we be worried about it? Is this time different? How do we, how do we yeah. break this down? Well, first off, I'm just happy that you landed that intro. I really didn't think uh, you we, were going to get we there, got there, but you got there. We got All there. All right. So according to the Fed's models, because of how rapidly they raised the Fed funds rate, um, and to the magnitude that they did. We're talking about the second fastest rate hiking cycle in history. They were thinking the unemployment rate at this point would be well above 5%. And while you landed the intro, you ruined the slides. And we're back. <laughs> um, well above 5%, and we would be in a recession right now. And that's clearly not the case. Uh, in fact, the opposite has happened, where economic growth has accelerated. So. There are really only a couple explanations for this. One is this time is not different. We know monetary policy impacts the economy through long and variable lags. And what that means is you hike interest rates today, it doesn't mean you're going to have a recession tomorrow. It means you could have a negative impact on economic growth at some point in the distant future, some unknown time. Yep. And typically the two areas of the economy and financial markets that are sort of the most lagged in terms of their relationship with the Fed, Fed rate hikes are the labor market and credit spreads. And you know, those are the big things right now. Credit spreads are extremely tight and the labor and the unemployment rate is still relatively yeah. low. So the first plausible explanation here is this cycle isn't that different. The lags are just a little longer and more variable and the boogeyman's right around the corner. Yep. Um, so that's one. The market clearly doesn't think that's the case. We'll talk about that later. We'll see, yeah. So then you have to get into the second explanation of what's going on here, that this time is different. For some reason, uh, rate hikes just hurt less this time around. You know, rate hikes going into the 2008 global financial crisis, rate hikes going into the early 2000s, they hurt more. And so we can talk about why that might be. Why did rate hikes hurt less this yep. time around? And if the hikes hurt less, then that begs the question, well, will the cuts help more? Right. Because in prior monetary cycles, a few hikes hurt a lot, but a few cuts help very little. Yep. And so the Fed needed to sort of raise interest rates like an escalator, slowly, methodically, trying to see, hey, how much is this really going to hurt the economy? And then they have to cut rates like an elevator. 
wow, yeah. we really need to react here to try to right the ship, save the economy. This time, the hikes hurt less, so if you cut just a few times, are you actually going to be able to stimulate economic growth? That's the big question, right? Because we're talking about yeah. this rotation within equity markets, and we're saying just a few rate cuts will probably be the catalyst. So we have some explaining to do. Why do we think that might be the case? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And, and you, know, you mentioned perhaps something was different this time that allowed these cuts to not be as restrictive. Mm -hmm. I think we have an idea of, of what that was, you know, looking at this page here, looking at net private saving versus net government saving. You can see, um, historically speaking, typically these lines are very close to mirror images of, of each other. And you can just look at, you know, March 2022, right about here is when the hike started. You can see the private sector in relative to GDP, relative to its own history, just at all time highs from a, a strong balance sheet perspective. You have all this net private savings maintaining that through the rate hike cycle, rate hikes actually help net savers and you know th yep. those hikes not nearly as restrictive as they otherwise would have been. Yeah. Right? Yep. If, if, if you're the Fed and you're thinking, how do I get the most bang for my buck in terms of rate hikes? Yep. Um, you know, just a few hikes hurt a lot. What type of scenario would that be? That would be if the private sector had a lot of debt. Yeah, it's like, oh wait. A lot of debt. Had a lot of debt. Yeah. Um, the interest rate on that debt was variable. Variable, variable rate debt. Yep. And or Need to needed to over. be rolled over quickly. Yeah. That's how you get the quickest, most significant pass through of higher interest rates to damaging the private sector. Yep. And that's how you bring down economic growth, bring down inflation, increase the unemployment rate. Yeah. Um, that was 08, right? If you go back to where we are today and you look at those private sector savings, mm -hmm. Well, it's very different. So maybe pre-COVID there was a little bit of that, but COVID was sort of the great reset for the private sector. Um, savings behavior increased quite a bit. Yep. So balance sheets were cleaned up. Interest rates were very low, so debt that was going to roll over was refinanced, and a lot of it was termed out. So now you have very strong private sector savings. And when we talk about the private sector, we're talking about corporations and households. Right? We know there are some households that actually are in a very weak saving position right now, um, but those are generally lower income yep. households, meaning they represent a, very, a relatively smaller portion sure. of the screen line. Um, so they sort of reset their balance sheets, refinanced debt, termed it out. Um, and so if you look at it from that perspective, yeah, the rate hikes didn't hurt that much. Yeah. People didn't need to realize those higher interest costs. I mean, my mortgage rate is below 3.5%, and there's still 20 years <laughs> left on it, right? So there's really no pass-through for me personally, in that, and, and I'm sort of indicative of the average right. experience yeah. of American households in this situation. So definitely, if you follow that logic and you say, well, is there, are there any negative consequences from interest rate hikes for the government, for the public sector? Yeah, I mean, interest costs are increasing quite a bit. And normally what would happen there if interest costs are increasing for the government is government would look at that and say, we need to shore up our deficit situation. Yep. We need to raise taxes and or cut spending. And you think, well, either of those actions would hurt economic growth. So that's one pass through. But that hasn't happened either. Yeah, there, and you start to handicap the potential for that happening anytime soon, given the upcoming election, right? Right. It, it yeah. doesn't seem like that's a highly likely outcome. That's not a bipartisan issue right now. Yeah. Um, yep. So that transmission mechanism hasn't materialized either. So it begs the question, if the hikes didn't hurt, or the hikes hurt less than they normally do, yeah. because of these balance sheet dynamics, this private sector saving and this government borrowing, Will the cuts help more? And in theory, that's, that's a very valid argument. Because yeah. if you're in the private sector, probably the best area of the economy to think about when you think about this dynamic is the housing market right now. Mm. right? And we've seen how incredibly sensitive how the housing market is to a relatively small change in mortgage rates 
If yeah. you get a half a percent or, or even a 1% decrease in mortgage rates, housing activity goes up, right? So very sensitive because the private sector is in a position where they can take on more debt. Their right. balance sheet allows them to do so. Their incomes allow them to do so. The debt's just a little expensive. They just want a little lower interest rate. Yeah. And so if interest rates fall, you might not need that many to stimulate economic growth. Yeah. And, and or even if you go absent the debt route, if short-term rates are coming down, all of a sudden my cash is less attractive to hold. Yes. My, those savings are less attractive to just park there. Other projects start to look more exciting, relatively yep. speaking. And that's going to spur economic growth potentially yep. as well. Absolutely. So, so yeah, just to, to tie a bow on that, you, you, we hear this idea all the time of the Fed pushing on a string, right, on you know, one side of the policy um, cycle. And typically, you have messy balance sheets, you have a rate hike cycle that, uh, or a rate cut cycle that allows these corporations to clean up their balance sheets, but doesn't, the pushing on the string part is the economic growth doesn't typically expand from there. Right. The Fed needs to keep rates low for a long period of time. Yep. What could potentially be different, if that's the side of the coin we're on, is the Fed was kind of pushing on the string during the hike cycle. Yeah. They were trying. They were kind of fighting against these forces during the hike cycle and actually benefiting net savers, yeah. while they were trying to dampen inflation and economic growth. So, um, you know, like, like we talked about, one of two potential outcomes. This is status quo. The lagged and variable effects are coming, or this starting situation of such healthy savings is going to allow this time to potentially be different. And you just look at this table very briefly, and you can tell which side of the, the argument the stock market is on. Just continues to be a lot of green across the board. Year to date, almost every major area of the global stock market is green. Uh, anything we want to hit on from a, a global equity perspective uh, while we're here? Well, over the one year, large caps have dominated. Yep. And we're talking about this potential for a rotation and small caps, and that being catalyzed by rate cuts where just a few cuts might go a long way yep. this time around. And that starts to show out, although it doesn't show over the one-year time period, Yeah, since November 1st, which is what we're looking at here, growth of $100 for the S&P 500 in dark blue and then the Russell 2000 or small caps in light blue, since November 1st, small caps have kept pace, um, which anybody who's been watching markets and has just been thinking about the Magnificent Seven and the dominance of the S&P 500, this may be surprising. But in our view, small caps are a coiled spring. They're cheap relative to history. We showed that out in prior videos. Um, yep. They're very cheap within our framework. And the reason why we picked since November 1st is because that was, th that was really the, the first time we started to get um, the inflation data to come down in a way that allowed the Fed to shift the conversation from talking about potential hikes to now talking about potential cuts. So yep. we think the market sort of believes it, that this rotation is possible. This price action is consistent with that. We just need to see the cuts materialize. Yep. Um, and then that outperformance, in our view, could really open up. Yeah, yeah, yeah certainly. And, and taking some of those ideas into account and looking at fixed income performance, right? Mm -hmm. we, seeing those cuts maybe getting closer to materializing, or at least the market feeling a little bit better about three cuts coming in 2024. Mm -hmm. you, you see you know, the two-year with strongest you know, relative performance on the maturity spectrum thus far here in March. And then just looking at year to date, this, this relates back to what we were talking about, you see the steepener, right? The longer-term portion of the curve underperforming the short-term portion of the curve because longer-term yields have risen. Mm -hmm. uh, that, in our opinion, relates to that idea of getting more bang for your buck on the cut side from a Fed perspective. If they're getting more of an impact from each cut, that should yeah. could potentially lead to more of a steepener from the fixed income side. Another way to think about it is if just a few cuts are pretty stimulative this time around, mm -hmm. well, then the Fed doesn't need as many cuts. Right. Because say it's just three quarter of a percentage point cuts or four quarter of a percentage point cuts and economic growth starts to pick back up again. And maybe, unfortunately, inflation starts to pick mm. back up again. Well, that means the Fed may be done cutting when they get down to three and a half, four percent. And in this post-landing environment, mm 
you know, we're talking about the landing, the no landing, the immaculate, the immaculate landing. landing. When they've landed the plane, if the Fed funds rate is at three and a half to four percent, well, what does that mean for the ten-year Treasury yield? Yeah. Right. What does that mean for the thirty-year Treasury yield? I mean, the ten-year Treasury yield today is about four point three percent is the yield. We would expect if there are no recession fears, you know, and the Fed lands the plane and the Fed funds rate, the three-month Treasury bill, you can get four. You should probably have a higher be yield than the where we are now on the tenure. And so that's the steepener, right? Right. That would be the steepener trade. And yes, that's consistent with what we're seeing in markets. Great. Awesome. Well, let's wrap up getting into the uh, economic framework components, inflation. Uh, we've talked about the, the projection for inflation to come down throughout the remainder of 24. Our projection now here for early 2025, south of 2%. Uh, Mike, anything you want to add from an inflation standpoint? The path and the level now are consistent with adjustment cuts, in our view, starting in June, and then in September, and then in December. Yep. And those adjustment cuts would be supportive of liquidity, the environment we continue to see uh, recovering somewhat healthily uh, in the second half of 2024. Mm -hmm. And then from an economic growth perspective, you know, we talked about, we, we highlighted this impact here, uh, economic growth continued to grow. Um, Q1 GDP now north of 2%, so indications that economic growth continues to kind of hum along. Yep. Yep. And then on the recession front, we referenced a couple of these things earlier, but not only not much red in the lower three quarters here, but not much yellow either. Uh, you talked about how um, labor market and credit spreads could be you know, two of the, the last things to come from a, a lagged and variable impact standpoint. Those all clear here from a recession signal standpoint. So our yep. recession signal not uh, picking up any indicators uh, from those. And then, of course, the red area, the only one yep. of the four sub-signals that has consistently been active is the yield curve. And you look at some of these dynamics, um, the 10-year yield is right now 1.02% below the three-month yield. Yep. And our view is if the Fed's able to cut three times, so if they cut three um, quarter of a percentage point cuts this year, that'll obviously bring down the three month and the 10 year, if everything it goes well with our, in line with our forecast in terms of economic growth, inflation, the 10 year could drift up. Right. And that's just a long way of saying these yield curve inversions, if the boogeyman isn't right around the corner, right, yeah. uh, those yield curve inversions could clear up by the end of the year. Yeah. And if these inversions go away, I mean, this is a very boring table. It is. Not, uh, not much to highlight there. Yeah. All right. Well, that'll do it for us uh, for this edition of CapStrat this week. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to reach out. Thanks. Thanks.